As a young child, I learned all about the enormous effect that little changes in diet and lifestyle can have on a person's health status and their ability to enjoy life. See, from an early age, I had had some pretty serious health problems, and my parents tried all of these different things to get rid of those problems, and nothing worked until they changed my diet and some elements about how I was living. Those problems went away and never came back. I then saw the exact same thing play out when both my father and my grandmother were diagnosed with some serious chronic degenerative diseases. In the case of my grandmother, a life-threatening disease. Nothing worked for them either until they changed their diet and their lifestyle. Those problems went away and never came back. 20 years later, I heard a man speak who had the research and scientific data to explain not only why these interventions are so effective, but why they are the best hope for anybody looking to regain and maintain their health for a lifetime. And today, I've brought that man in to share that information with everyone. Let's get into this. Welcome, welcome everyone. I have a super special treat for you guys today. My mentor, Dr. James Chestnut is here with us. He is a chiropractor. He founded Eat Well, Move Well, Think Well, and he is an internationally recognized speaker and a wellness pioneer. Thank you so much for being here, Dr. Chestnut. It's my pleasure. Thanks. Yeah, my, my, um, we met many, many years ago. I took your <laughs> postdoctorate course, um, when I, when I was still doing my residency in school. So I was in my final year wow. of school and, and, uh, one of my, one of my classmates handed me an audio CD. So I'm dating myself of you speaking. And this is really funny because I popped it in my car on the long drive home. I went to school in Los Angeles and the traffic was horrendous. And I listened to you that day. And I was so pissed off because I was like, I just spent six figures on this chiropractic school education, and I haven't heard any of this stuff. So where did this guy come from and how can I hear more of him? And that's when I really sought you out. I bought your first four books. That was darn near 20 years ago at this point. And then I promptly enrolled in your program, which made me sweat a little bit because it seemed expensive to a college graduate uh, or a chiropractic school graduate who was up to his ears in, in debt at yeah, the time. But I bet. Uh, best investment of my life. I bet you got a good return on that in the end. <laughs> yes, amazing investment. In fact, if yeah. I show you the original first four books, they're highlighted and dog-eared and there's notes all in the column. So yeah, I benefited and uh, 17 years of chiropractic practice, many, many, many patients have benefited from your teaching. So uh, first off, let me just say thank you for that. It's my pleasure. And that my greatest reward, as I was just saying off camera, um, is 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 when you can make a difference. And And the other thing is, your kids are healthier, man. Yes. Like what you learn in those modules allowed you to live a, you know, to understand how to live a lifestyle that gave you and your whole family and everyone that you taught the ability to express your potential, right? 100%. Just, just understanding. And so it's the, I love, I love seeing children raised in a healthy environment with a healthy lifestyle. That's huge. And I'm, I'm really glad you were successful in practice because you deserve it and you helped a lot of people. And then you saw their kids be healthy. Yes. Right. Yeah. And so, um, that's the goosebump part for me. That that's always the best part, part for me. Um, well, you, you and I do like good. the fact that you sweated a little bit because I enjoy <laughs> that too. <laughs> well, I, I was fully invested. Yeah. But, but I, I, mm. I saw, uh, you know, um, generations of the same family yep. in practice, you know, they, yeah. what bigger compliment can somebody give to you than handing over their kid and saying, help me with this. Right. Or asking you about, Hey, do you think I should feed my kid this formula or what? And it's just like, well, why don't you start by reading the ingredients that out loud cool. to me? That's what I'd always do. I'm sure I told you those stories uh, and just, and they read it out loud and they're like, wait, wait a minute this doesn't sound healthy. I'm like, exactly. So number one, breastfeed, but if you can't, for some reason, um, but you should, but if you can't, for some reason, pump, and if you can't do that, then there's a lot, uh, you know, you can just start from kids early on and just, just get them those essential nutrients that they need all throughout their lives. Yeah. But you know, such a huge patient education component in what we learned in your program. And you said something to, to us, and it felt like you were speaking directly to me and you were saying, 
you know, anybody can do the hands-on stuff. People don't come to you for that. You said, and I quote, a monkey can do this. Patients come to you for this. And right. that was something super powerful that stuck with me because that was really the foundation for me being successful in practice was everybody walks around nowadays with a damn supercomputer in their hands. I'm not going to blow their minds with anything that I tell them. My job was to coach them and guide them and make sure that they they didn't get sucked into uh, misinformation. And and there's every, there's so many voices pulling on people nowadays. They they really you know it's almost like death by a thousand cuts. That is it's like they're bombarded with so much information that it's it's like paralysis by analysis. Yeah, and I think I I, I mean I always like I I mean I do remember saying that very often, but I would I, I would always you know, sort of qualify by saying you, you adjusting the physical part of adjusting is incredibly powerful, but it's the analysis that counts. It's your hands on the patient to figure out where to adjust sure. that nobody else can do. Sure. Anybody can learn the motor skill. Mm -hmm. And the more you practice, the better you become at that motor skill. And it does make a difference. Sure. You know, a quicker, a quicker adjustment, you know, is better than a slow one. Sure. You, you get it right. So there is a skill to it. And it is a unique skill to chiropractors, but the most unique skill is figuring out where to adjust. Mm -hmm. And then a monkey can do it, right? No, you know what I mean? Like that's not the hard part. But the big thing is, is telling people why you're adjusting them yes. and telling them what else they need to do in their lives that to get it. and stay well, that, right? That because it's the, the package that deal that makes all the difference. You, you can't adjust somebody out of bad nutritional choices. Yes. You can't adjust somebody out of a sedentary lifestyle. And you yeah. can't adjust somebody out of self-hate or self-loathing or low self-esteem or no gratitude or no integrity, right? So, so, so the adjustment's important, sure. but it can't solve problems created by unhealthy lifestyle. Yeah, so that was the part that really stuck with me. And I, I wasn't trying to, to uh, say that it wasn't important. It was, hey, open your eyes to all of these other things. You get a very limited time with that patient. Correct. And Correct. teaching them what they can do to amplify their own health and that of their family, like we were talking about, is probably the most powerful impact that you can make on that person's and life. And you don't have to think about doing the adjustment when you become subconsciously competent. Yes, it's it's such a it's such a learned motor pattern for you and your 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 you know your your uh, you know I always call it the Pacinian corpuscles or you know your sensory thing in your fingers like you become so trained sure. that that part's automatic for you. Yeah, right. You know you can just do it with your eyes closed, literally. Mm -hmm. Correct. Yeah. But it's the engagement with the patient to get them to choose a different path in their life, which number one is going to make them realize the value of coming in regularly, sure. right? To maintain that physical part. But the other one is, is that you can get them to make better choices in their life. And that is really going to be the, the biggest impact, right? Sure. It's what patients do on their own. That makes the biggest difference. hundred percent, hundred percent, hundred percent. So, so, so we have proud in our skill, but humility in the impact in terms of we, we know we have to get them to make good choices at home. That was it. And that that's really what I took away from it was, was your role as an educator at this stage in what healthcare has become is right. more important than oh. what you can teach the patient to do for themselves is so much more important than what you do for them. Correct. Given where we're coming from, we're not saving people's life when they've been shot or something like exactly. that. Yep, exactly. But we can teach them how to save their own life and live a much better life. Correct. And we can make them, I mean, the truth is, is that if if they're just in, in pain and, and all they want to do is get a bit of relief and they've got spinal problems, we know we're the best. Even if they do nothing else, if they come to us, it's better than taking an NSAID. According to Cochrane Review, it's better than taking paracetamol. It's better than getting a joint injection. It's better than getting surgery. It's better than going to a physical therapist, getting passive stuff, passive modalities and all this stuff. It's better than ART. It's better than massage. Like, we're the best if all they want is to just get some relief. Mm -hmm. But we're hoping that we can inspire people to want to live a life that's more than just getting some relief. 100%. Right? We want them to, we want them to live, not exist. We want them to experience life as you and I get to experience it because of our choices. That's it. And I think that's the big difference. So one of the things that's really shocking is this state that the world finds itself in with regard to chronic pain. There's Somewhere oh. to the tune of one and a half billion people, roughly 20% of the world's population that's suffering with chronic pain currently. It's way higher than that. I, I would suggest it's it's 20% that go get any help so they can get recorded. Yeah. Right. Think how many people have no resources. Yes. So they're never going to go seek help. 
So yeah, but one of the things that's really shocking about that is because you hear that figure, you think of the globe and you think that that one and a half billion is evenly distributed, but it isn't. It's concentrated in certain places in the world and it's less prevalent in other places. And this is echoed in some of the leading journals that are predicting that the number of people suffering with chronic pain is going to be increasing significantly in the coming years, specifically as a result of a global population shift away from low-income countries and the traditional lifestyles that people live there and the adoption of the modern lifestyle. Yep. And I think, I think there's two things. There, there are some, there are some confounders there. Um, one is that it's the people who live in cities who can get recorded, mm -hmm. who can be part of the data. Sure. Right. The, so, so it's very hard to study a hunter gatherer tribe and, and figure out the chronic pain in the middle of the jungle when you can't get there. Sure. So we know two things for sure. One is that we're not catching everybody in the net when we're looking at this number of how many people are suffering with chronic pain. But the other thing we know for absolute certain is as people move away from how they're supposed to live, how they eat, move, and think, which would be more likely that you're going to live closer to the way your species is supposed to live if you're rural and poor. Sure. Um, if you're poor, if not if you're poor in the city. If you're poor in the city, you'll never get, you won't be one of these stats. Part of this data, if you look in Calcutta, those people aren't getting interviewed about their chronic pain. If you look at, if you look in Egypt in the garbage dump where a million people live in the dump, those people aren't part of the data. They're poor, but they're poor living in the cities. What we really should distinguish about is not poverty, but in terms of whether or not they're living a more agrarian sort of um, agricultural style life, or if they're in a city living a, living a domesticated um, you know, urban city life. And sure. what we know is the urban city life is much more harmful mm -hmm. than the agrarian life. Yeah. So there's good statistics on that for as related to the most common chronic pain condition in the world, which is back pain, uh, yeah. that, that, uh, back pain is significantly higher in urban populations than it is among uh, rural counterparts by at least twofold. Um, and then, and then we do have data comparing uh, developed countries to undeveloped countries, and and that echoes your sentiment, right? And the the what's really interesting is that white collar back pain is as prevalent as blue collar back pain, mm -hmm. meaning that it's not because people have a job where they lift things that they get back pain, That's right. because it's as prevalent in people who sit at a desk all day. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So all this work before about teaching people how to bend when they lift and all these silly, you know, lumbar belts that they, you know, spent billions of dollars on, they're completely useless because the truth is the less work you do, the more likely you are to have pain. Yeah, certainly there's 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 different types of pain and and we've been taught to kind of think like what you were saying that oh these labor saving devices are going to prevent the pain but it it turns out nowadays that you know the practice is is full of people who are reinforcing their pain syndromes via lack of movement and Correct. and being physically unfit to support their own body. Correct. So chopping wood relieves pain. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. Not the first time you do it because you're out of shape, sure. but that's not, that's the different kind of pain. That's the overuse pain. Sure. You know what I mean? Well, you're not overusing it. It's that you've been, I used to say to all the, all the time, people come and say, Oh doc, I overdid it. I said, well, you know, you worked for two hours out of the last five years. You're not overdoing it, Jack wagon. Sure. You've been underdoing it and you're unfit and you, you know, you're under muscled, you're under your everything, you're deconditioned to an nth degree. And you just went and did something that you shouldn't have even noticed. And now you're saying you overdid it. Yeah, you've got to rethink that you didn't overdo it last weekend. You've been underdoing it for 10 years. Well said. And if you don't see it that way, then you're going to avoid even the little things that you did that aggravated your deconditioned body. Yeah, it's the opposite. You've got that to do is. more, not less. So you get to that Wally, -E, that that Disney movie where every everybody's floating around in a cushion that has a built-in bathroom, and they never have to even lift a finger to do anything. But it's you such know. a good movie, yeah, isn't it? It's such a it's such an eye-opening movie if you see it correctly. You that's know, it. If, got, if you're viewing it through the right lens, it's it's very well done. Yeah, it's so very that's clever. 
that's one of the things that I talk about with my patients is, you know, so much when you're living in the modern world, and I talk about it with my members, when you're living in the modern world, you have to go out of your way to fulfill these basic requirements, you know, park at the further spot and walk a little bit further, take the stairs, you know, it's, 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 uh, you know, chop wood, I chop wood three times a week. Um, and, and, I, and I go out and just bring in, bring in the firewood for the family in, in a place where we don't need fires to keep us warm. Right. Yeah. I just do it because so I want it. And the fact of the matter is, is that, you know, um, you, you will always look and feel the way you behave. You, you, you look and feel according to your chronic choices. Mm -hmm. So if you chop wood all the time, you look like you chop wood all the time. You know, if you sit at a desk all the time and eat garbage food, you'll look like you sit at a desk and eat garbage food. Like you might get away with it for a few years, but eventually everybody looks like what they do. Yes. Well said. It's so Correct. funny too, because it feels like what they do. That's it. Well, they go in hand in hand, right? Of course they do. Yeah. So the, it's, it's so interesting that the, the beauty aesthetic that is innate to most people is a body that is obvious that they engage in physical work. 100%. And then and then most people don't want to engage with in a smile work. on their face. Yeah. And kindness in their hearts. Yeah. So you mentioned there a second ago uh if you eat garbage food you're going to look like you eat garbage food and you're going to feel like that too. One mm -hmm. of the things that I really wanted to to talk to you about on on this um on this call is your take on the dietary practices in 2022 and 2023, there's a lot of very vocal people out there who have huge followings, who are advocating very extreme positions when it comes to human dietary intake. And I, and I think probably no one is more well-versed on the scientific literature regarding the innate requirements for human diet than you. So what do you think about people who are taking these very extreme stances, advocating carnivore diets for the general public and things like that. And people who are profiting uh, by instilling a fear of plants into, <laughs> yes, that's. Well, this is what I try to say to people. Let's step back and look at it as a biologist and you're studying, um, you know, animal species or mammalian species. So that's all we are. We're just, a, we're just mammals. So let's study ourselves like mammals, which is what I've done, which has made what, what my conclusions so unique. Now, if I was in biology, my conclusions would be lazy, would, would, would be self-evident. If we were studying any other species other than humans, we would say, well, the diet for a giraffe is the giraffe diet. It's the diet that giraffes have evolved with and, and you know, adapted to over millennia. So there is a species specific diet for giraffes. That would be true for, for monkeys. It would be true for, for rabbits. It would, you know what I mean? So in other words, each species has a diet and that diet is based on millennia, year, you know, of, 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 of the, of the species adapting in, in concert with the environment so that each species now has a very specific genetic recipe of what it requires in terms of ingredients to produce healthy structure and function. That's no different than humans. I won't go too down too far down the, the rabbit hole, but just if people could just step back and go, well, what's the human species diet? What is the diet that fueled human evolution? What is the diet that we are required genetically to consume? What are these nutrients that we need? And if we don't get these nutrients, we can't produce healthy structure and function. We must have these in order to produce it. And that's true of all of us because we all have the human genome. We are all so similar genetically that you can take any human being from anywhere on earth and mate that human being with any other human being on earth and they can produce offspring. That's how similar we are genetically. So we all know we all need the same nutrients. We don't have to eat the same diet. What a diet is, is the foodstuffs that you consume in order to get the nutrients you need. You can get nutrients that are very similar from different types of foods. So when you lived in Africa, when we all lived in Africa, when we started to leave Africa, you know, we had to find different foodstuffs that contained the nutrients that we need. So when you left Africa and ended up in, you know, around the North Pole, 
you weren't going to get a lot of fruits for vitamin C. So you had to eat seal skin, which are full of collagen, which you could get your vitamin C. You were going to eat a ton of omega-3 fatty acids from blubber. You weren't going to get it from, from you know, wild, wild game meat in the same way. So what humans did is they, as we moved around the planet, is they all, in order to survive, they all had to find sources of these essential nutrients that are matched to the human genome or the human species requirements. That's the human diet. So what I can tell you is clearly the human genome is not suited for a carnivore diet because that's just not a human diet. However, it is suited for a diet which is much, much higher in protein and fat than the food guides would tell you. There's no question about it. The food guides were utter and total disasters. They created a, an absolute pandemic of obesity and increased cancer and heart disease. The food guide was had nothing to do with science and the human diet. It had everything to do with the with the with the uh, uh, um, promotion of agricultural products that American and Canadian farmers were producing and European yeah. farmers. Yeah. So the food guide is a joke. So once that happened and we realized the food guide was such a joke and people are now admitting it, like you need dairy and grains as the basis of it, that's ridiculous, right? So um, it, it opened up the door for people to come out with these extreme diets. And what I'll tell you is because the, the actual uh, so-called expert, the food guide recommendations are so despicably unhealthy for humans, virtually any change from that will produce greater structure, healthier structure and function. Not what it's supposed to be, but I will tell you, if you ate a carnivorous, like the paleo diet, or you ate any of these other diets, or, or you went vegan, or you went vegetarian, instead of the, of the actual diet, the so-called experts recommend, you're better off than that. Mm -hmm. You're just not anywhere near as, as healthy as if you ate the diet that's suited for the human species. Very well said. So that, that's, that's a situation where your your body has certain nutrient deficiencies. I just I just read a study uh, that was published in 2021 that showed that roughly 60% of the American diet is coming from ultra processed foods. So what you would say is a carnivore diet is certainly a vast improvement over consuming 60% of your calories from ultra processed right. foods, but yeah. it's not what's optimal. No, but I mean, let's say you've got a choice and you're like, okay, I'm going to have... Uh you know, the, 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 the high carb cereal with, 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 with hormone fed, you know, cows that have never eaten grass because they're eating green. And I'm going to feed that, and that milk now has no calcium in it. So I'm going to have to put calcium supplements in it, it has no vitamin D in it. So I'm going to have to add vitamin D to it. So it's all fortified. It's great. And no human being requires milk from another mammal anyway, long story, but it's just so ridiculous. But imagine you're feeding your kid breakfast cereal because that's what you're told is part of a balanced breakfast. Mm -hmm. But the other person says, I'm going for the carnivore diet. I'm going to feed my kids six eggs. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Which kid's healthier? Yeah. Six eggs every time? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. hundred percent. The, 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 the only thing that drives me uh, a, a little crazy about it is, is that they, they push forth this idea, even on any level, that, that, that chronic degenerative disease is because people are consuming too many vegetables. You know, watch out yeah. for watch no, out. For no, no good evidence for that whatsoever. Um, nutrition studies are very hard because it's very hard to isolate a food sure. and find out what the effects of that food are because that food is being consumed with a whole bunch of other foods, no matter what. Sure. There's no diet study that said you can only eat broccoli. Sure. Right. Number one. Number two, what that food does to you how your body utilizes it or what if negative effects it might have is profoundly influenced by your level of exercise. Sure. And it is profoundly influenced by your state of emotional well-being or psychological fitness. Yes. Because that changes your hormonal levels to an, 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 an incredible degree. Yeah. So, so it's very hard to get good diet studies because of those reasons. Sure, right. Sure. But what I can tell you is there's some common sense and logic to this. If we look re retrospectively to our ancestors, even our near ancestors who were basically farmers, right? Before we, before this agricultural sort of like the industrial agricultural after World War II. But if you go back to people who ate a lot of vegetables, 
because there was lots that did, right? When you look at the diet of people, you know, that the rural sort of farmer that, that was, you know, throughout m most areas before World War II. Well, they were eating all these foods that people are now telling you are going to kill you, right? They were eating lots of these vegetables and they didn't, the cancer rates weren't the same, the, degenerate, the, the degenerative changes weren't the same, the heart disease wasn't the same, the obesity wasn't the same, the diabetes wasn't the same, the cancer rates weren't the same, the depression and anxiety and suicides weren't the same, but they, they were consuming all these foods, right? But they weren't consuming the processed foods and they, and they weren't consuming the, the medications as much and they were moving more and they had more social support. So I agree with you 100%. These people who are trying to come out now and tell you, you're going to drop dead if you eat broccoli. Yeah. Now, there are some vegetables that are worse than others and some fruits that are worse than others. There's, there's no doubt about that. And a lot of them now have been modified so much. Um, you know, we could question that, I think. Sure. But the fact of the matter is, if you eat a diet that is rich in fatty meat and vegetables and berries, you're one healthy son of a gun. <laughs> so well said. You know, one of the things that that, that some of these people are, are really fond of saying is that plants don't want to be eaten, which is why they produce these uh, certain chemicals and toxins in low levels to uh, discourage uh, the plant or, or animals from eating them. Uh, but, but you know, uh, hormesis is created in many instances by the consumption of small amounts of those toxins. Right. And, Correct. I, and and some of them are methyl donors which really have an effect on your epigenome which really they're, they're proven to like broccoli is one of the few things that have been proven to reduce cancer sure. i mean literally the methyl the methyl donor but what they've done is they've taken the very good evidence about about gluten about grains which humans are not designed to eat genetically that's not part of the human diet nor is dairy no grain right because but grains do produce anti-nutrients like gluten and gliadin. And the reason they do that is to protect their offspring because grasses, their babies are seeds, mm -hmm. grains. Sure. And they drop to the ground. And what they do is they want to be eaten, but not broken down. So that when they get pooped out by the bird, you got their offspring with fertilizer. Sure. Yeah, yeah. And humans never evolved eating grains. We would have starved to death trying to gather them. Yeah, yeah. As hunter gatherers before farming, right? So we never developed the digestive enzymes to deal with those. Neither did cows. That's why cows get so sick when you feed them grain, yeah. but not the grass. Yes. And so, but people have taken those concepts, which are true, and they've tried to apply them to anything that isn't a steak. Yes. Which is false. Yeah. So, and, and the thing that I always wanted to say to them when they say plants don't want to be eaten is, uh, do you think those animals want to be eaten? <laughs> Correct. Like, yeah, exactly. Like, you know, like, why don't you hand, hand wrestle a bison and, and tell me if it wants to be eaten? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that, that's a different story. If you're killing your own meat, I'm sure, I'm sure that they would like to find out what it's like to go hunting and, and, and clean the animal themselves and prepare it to be eaten. Well, there's no doubt that the healthiest people on earth were very, very, um, had diets which were very high in meat. Yeah. No, no question about it, but that meat was grass fed. Sure. They had to work very hard to get it. Yeah. Walk miles and miles and jog and run and, and, you know, and then they had to carry it back. Then they slow cooked it generally. Yeah. Um, and so, but the reason they were healthy from that meat is, is it doesn't matter where your protein comes from. An amino acid is amino acids, but that meat was full of omega-3 fatty acids. And that's the key to the grass fed meat. That's what made humans humans. Our brains, our cortex, what what differentiates us from 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 uh, our closest relatives, which are which which are the primates, the chimpanzees, the other primates, we are primates, is our cortex, and our cortex is made of omega three fatty acids, which we got from meat. Period. Mm. Yeah, so it, it's it's not the inclusion of meat that's the issue. It's the issue that they're they're you know pushing forward a fear of plants, you know, to yes. a population that's it's really a very nuanced conversation. I think you presented it perfectly. It's not the inclusion of meat. It's the inclusion of meat to the exclusion of everything else. Correct. Yeah. And 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 assuming, especially these paleo people, that all meat is created equal. Yes. So just you know, eat, eat your eat your face off of of grain fed bacon. Yeah. And it's like you know, well, wait a minute. Like that's just a corn delivery system. Like the cows just eat corn till they're sick and get, I mean, 90% of cows in these feedlots have, have liver tumors in six weeks. Yeah. And so it's like, there's a huge difference between, and, and, and every study that comes out and says, well, people who eat less meat are healthier. So you shouldn't eat meat. That's just stupid. 
Mm-hmm. That's just ignorant, re- understanding the science. It's bad meat. Yes. So yeah. good meat is healthy. Bad meat is unhealthy. So that's that's a very it's a very uh, it's a very important point. And and one of the things that people talk about in in the fitness space very often nowadays is is calories in versus calories out with no consideration whatsoever of where those calories are coming from. And I think that's also doing a, a disjustice to uh, a disservice to people uh, because you know a, a body that consumes fifteen hundred calories a day from high quality omega three rich meat and fruits and vegetables is going to look very different than a, a body that that consumes 1500 calories from mcdonald's a hundred percent and like just there's just no there's just no debate about it and not only that but these high carb diets also change you hormonally so you get insulin resistance then you've got you know it it, it, it completely changes your ability to to um to burn fat and and so there's no doubt that the same amount of calories of a high carb diet, because what's interesting is this obesity pandemic that's just gone crazy over the last 30 years. Sure. I mean, we're talking six, seven, eight hundred percent increase in obesity yeah. and diabetes, type 2 diabetes, um, has occurred without a, a major change in our caloric consumption. So, how do you it's explain the, that? It's the type of because we're eating high fructose corn syrup, we're eating things that change our body's chemistry so significantly. Mm-hmm. Um, so that we're so that we're not we're not not we're not able to burn those calories the same way we store them because we have high sugar high blood sugar all the time and you're and, combining and get, that and we with get them. insulin resistance which yeah. changes our energy levels you know it changes everything it makes us more likely to have osteoporosis more likely to develop cancer more likely to develop to, to develop heart disease it's totally pro-inflammatory so yeah it's really interesting but if you look at the obesity it's not over the last 30 years our our obesity, our obesity rates have done this, yeah. but our total caloric consumption per day, even our energy expenditure hasn't gone down that much. It's the type of food we were taught to eat because this ridiculous uh, low fat craze came out and everyone was told, don't eat fat. Fat will make you fat. Eat sugar. Sugar won't make you fat or carbohydrate. And it's the exact opposite is true. And they were actually busted and got caught because they had paid John Hopkins to lie about the sugar industry had paid John Hopkins to lie and create a study that said sugar doesn't make you fat. Fat does. The exact opposite is true. Wow. So, so the obesity epidemic has skyrocketed while our calorie consumption has stayed relatively even. Relatively the same. And our physical activity has stayed relatively the same. And exactly. so, it's, so it's precisely proving that calories in, calories out is, is not valid. Where the calories are. Absolutely invalid. Well, yeah. just watch. Let's just do a study with like genetically identical twins, mm-hmm. right? So that means there can be no genetic uh, variable because they have identical genes. Mm-hmm. You feed one 1,500 calories of, you know, Fruit Loops and cheesecake and bread, white bread, and the other one you feed 1500 calories of the innate diet of, you know, grass fed meat, uh, you know, berries and and vegetables. Mm -hmm. Who do you think would be healthier after 10 years? Sure. Exact same calorie consumption, exact same genes. But I think you could take anyone, James, who 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 has no knowledge of nutritional science whatsoever, and they would get the correct answer to that question. hundred percent, they would. Of course, so, they would. So that brings me to a, a story that you tell in your book here, uh, which is phenomenal, and I recommend for everybody. Um, I'm going to do this. Watch this. I'm going to do this because this is the new book, which has all that and a little bit more, but but apparently much easier to read for the lay public. Okay, awesome. So I, I have that one on order now, so I'll I'll, okay. I'll be able to promote it soon. But so they um, could just go to eatwellmovewellthinkwell dot com and get get those books. Okay. Um, yeah. One of the stories that's incredibly powerful that you tell in that book is a story of you visiting a friend of yours who was diagnosed and treated for cancer in a hospital, and you were shocked by what you saw in that hospital. You saw, as you describe it in the book, a gentleman in a wheelchair with a urine bag on the side of him eating a donut while drinking coffee i and had a purchased in the hospital yes so there was a donut shop in the hospital in so the I, hospital. I had a similar situation where i went to visit a patient and a friend of mine who had undergone a very serious surgery for cancer and and while i was visiting him in the hospital they brought him the food and my jaw dropped to the floor when i saw what they brought this man to eat you say in your book there are no consequence-free choices. Correct. And I, I love that quote. 
How can we have a situation that you just described with the study on the identical twins, where we feed one Fruit Loops and cheesecake and the other high quality meat and vegetables, and people get the answer to that question right, and yet there's still a disconnect, Dr. Chestnut. There's a disconnect between that understanding and people's behavior. Well, sure, because we'll think of the hospital diet. How many people would agree that the diet in the hospital is ridiculous, that they wouldn't go home and try and replicate it because it was so healthy? They were in the hospital where they were the sickest they've been, where there was you know the most important thing to do whatever they could to get better. And the diet they got in the hospital was so good that they want to go home and replicate it. Nobody would say that. Agreed? Sure. The disconnect comes from people in authority. That hospital has about six different people checking which pill you take. And nobody except the dietitian that follows the four food groups, some so-called expert, cares about what goes in your mouth from food because they don't see that as part of the healing process. They don't see it as important and they have all the cultural authority. They, they, they are seen as the experts. They may have one to two hours of nutrition tops, but they're still seen as the experts. They might not have no ability at all to get a sick person well. They can only treat their sickness. They might have no idea how to prevent illness or, or, or even have an intelligent discussion of why the illness occurred in the first place, but they're still seen as the experts. And because it starts there, and they can and and the same people who, you know, big pharma and big food, the same people who run all these commercials and who fund all the medical schools and do all this stuff, they literally get to control really most of the information that people get. So people just don't really consciously think about, um, you know, the consequences of their choices in terms of diet, because everybody around them is doing the same thing and they just don't equate it to the cause of their illness. But if you said to somebody, would you, what's better, an apple or a donut? Everyone would say an apple, but they'd still eat the donut because they don't really see the donut as the thing that's causing them to be sick and obese and cancerous and whatever else. They, they're just told so many times that it's their genes or that it's just bad luck or whatever. It's not bad luck. It's not bad genes. It's bad choices and bad advice, actually. And so that's what I try to do with my book is I try to show people with unequivocal evidence that there is a direct relationship between their health, whether or not they get chronically ill, whether or not they ever get better, whether, what, you know, whether or not they have a, a high quality of life and enjoyment and, and their choices of how they eat, move and think. This is now irrefutable. I would, I could very happily debate this with anybody on earth. And in fact, you could bring a hundred of the, anybody you want, and I will happily debate them myself publicly about what the cause of chronic illness is, whether or not it's bad genes, bad luck, an inability to regulate your own cholesterol or moods or body weight, or whether it's, it's lifestyle and environment, habitat and lifestyle. And I can win that debate. Yes. I, 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 I just need people to know it and act upon it. Yeah. So that's actually one of the things that I, I wanted to do like a, a thought experiment with you. So I, I looked up the statistics from the United States Centers for Medicaid and Medicare Services. And according to their figures, the United States spent $4.3 trillion in 2021 on healthcare, which works out to darn near $13,000 per person in the United States. I then that's compared, doubled, by the way, in, in about a decade and a bit. It used to be 6,700. That's it. It's, it's, it's gone up significantly. Oh, it goes crazy, yeah. So uh, one of the things that they, they publish in this amazing uh, stats uh, report is the United States spending in comparison to other industrialized countries throughout. The, and I get, and from that nod, I'm guessing that you've seen this report. So we- Well, spend, the, there's been many of these reports. They've been coming out regularly for decades. Year. That's it. Yeah. 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 Every year. So, but but they, they also do rankings, Dr. Chestnut, which I'm sure you're aware of. So the United right. States is number one on healthcare spending by a significant margin. And yet on things like life expectancy, we rank 31st out of 38. On infant used to be 37. Yeah. So on other countries are gotten sicker. Uh, you haven't gotten healthier. Other countries have gotten sicker. And infant mortality were 33 out of 38. Correct. Estonia, hey. which spends less than a quarter of what we spend, is ranked first. Correct. So I, I it seems like we're not getting a very good return. Unless an, Est unless an Estonian moves to, to the United States, exactly. then they get as sick as everyone else. So it's not the genes of these people. 
because yeah. we know if they move around, right, they end up getting the illnesses that are prevalent in the lifestyle of wherever they move, right? So 100%. Yeah, 100%. So there was, there, so there was that, that tribe of Indians on at the Arizona border with Mexico, where half of them lived on the U.S. side and half of them lived on the America side. And they found that the Mexican side had way less diabetes. And as soon as you took a person out of that environment and moved them onto the U.S. side, the incidence right. of diabetes matched the environment. And what do they learn? They learn your diet. You, you know what? You're Hispanic. You have a greater susceptibility to diabetes. Yeah. Diabetes. That you're black the, yeah. you have a greater susceptibility to diabetes and i said well wait a minute how many blacks had diabetes in africa 200 years ago that's right zero or zero zero. Yeah. zero right how many how many how many blacks right now living the hunter-gatherer lifestyle the direct you know ancestors of the people in america who are obese and diabetic how many of their ancestors you know or relatives who live in africa and still live you know a relatively sort of healthy lifestyle how many of them have diabetes zero how many people in mexico you know, have diabetes that don't live in the city or 200 years ago. Remember the genes haven't changed That's it. in 10,000 years, but let's just go back a hundred years ago. How many Americans were obese? Very few. Very few. Look at that. I mean, look at this, the, the size of the seats in the stadiums. Look at like at the airplanes. Look at like we, we have all this data to show over the last 75 years that every chronic illness has gone like this. Yes. The genetic change has done zero. Yeah. But the chronic illnesses have all done this. How can we blame genes? Yes. Well, that, that's, that's exactly what I was saying because it relates directly to chronic pain because you're seeing exactly the same things. And in fact, yeah, chronic pain's see. a chronic illness. That's it. That's it. So that's so all it is. The thought experiment that I wanted to pose to you is it seems like the United States is not getting a very good return on their national investment, to say the least. To say the least. Neither yes. is Canada, ne ne neither is the UK, neither is any New Zealand, any of these Western countries are some of the European countries are better than are, are quite a bit better because they use uh, they, 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 they are so much less medicated. Yeah, they're so much more likely to walk because they just the lifestyle, right? They take trains, they all don't have automobiles. So they walk to train station, they walk to work. So their lifestyle is very different. Their food is much better. Yes. And they take way less medication. Yeah. So in, in, and so the medication point is interesting because in 2018, the Lancet did a huge study on the most common chronic pain condition in the world, which is the leading cause of disability worldwide as well, which is back pain. And their quote that the researchers found after going through all of this was that much of the care for this condition is unnecessary, ineffective, harmful, and is making the problem worse. 100%. The treatment, all that money that we're spending, that $4.3 trillion. Now, obviously, all of that doesn't apply to this one thing that I'm talking about, but the point is that we're- Hundreds spending. and hundreds of billions are spent on back pain. It's also the leading cause of early retirement. Yeah. Um, it's, the, it's the leading cause of disability. Sure. It's it's a massive, massive pandemic problem. So all this money that we're spending is leading to worse outcomes. Because there's not a shred of evidence for anything in usual medical care for this problem. And they will not refer to chiropractors, which has the only evidence-based intervention sure. in terms of a passive intervention, sure. which is a, a chiropractic adjustment or, or, or SMT. Sure. Uh, and no one is talking about the fact that these people are in pain because of their lifestyle. So they need to exercise. They need to obviously change their diet. And so, you know, again, you'll remember, this is what I've been teaching for 20 some odd years, which is to say, get, you know, get the patients moving, get their joints moving, get them to go home and keep them moving, get them to, to deal with the inflammatory diet, get them to deal with the, with the emotional stressors. And you know, lo and behold, these people who are apparently incurable are all of a sudden have a good life. So that's, that's Those really, patients don't realize that and they're not willing to put in that time. They're never going to get better. You cannot get better. First of all, even the passive care of usual medical, they don't have a single evidence-based intervention within their scope of practice. Yeah. Surgeries have going up every year. The, 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 the damage that's done by this, the number of people end up addicted and dying from opioids after surgery. Um, the NSAIDs don't work. Tylenol paracetamol doesn't work. Injections don't work. Muscle relaxants don't work. There is not a single thing that has any evidence. And yet these people are still saying, well, don't go to a chiropractor. We need more evidence. So, and amazing. yet the, the evidence is so clear. Yeah. Is by no stretch perfect, but is by far, by far the most evidence based intervention in the history of spinal health care for, for back pain. Sure. And we've known this for decades, but people just don't want to give up their reimbursement monopoly or their cultural authority monopoly. Mm -hmm. And 
what you and I try to under, make people understand is that yes, chiropractic is fantastic, but chiropractic plus a healthy lifestyle is what's going to make the the end game. Hundred percent. So the the there was a, a study that came out last year. I'm not sure if you saw it in the journal Science Translational Medicine that showed that the number one prescribed treatment for car- chronic pain conditions, which is non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. Uh, people who take those drugs and suppress the body's normal inflammatory response to things end up with pain that is worse and longer lasting. The same 100%. studies that we've seen in people who take opioids. So yes. as it turns out, your body's not stupid and it does know what it's doing when it produces that inflammation. And when you <laughs> artificially shut that down, your body Correct. finds a way through neuroplasticity to talk to you at a higher level to try and get you to listen. Correct. And also what happens is they're called resolvins. And so there's a whole system in the inflammatory pathways in your body that a big part of it is the resolving the inflammation. Mm -hmm. And what NSAIDs do, not only do they, do they, um, they initially can block the pro-inflammatory stuff, but eventually they actually block the resolving pathways. Mm -hmm. So that's why omega-3 fatty acids and vitamin D are so important because they actually work as the resolvent. Mm -hmm. So instead of being anti-inflammatory, you need to be pro-resolving inflammation. That's the only way to deal with it. Exercise does the same thing. So this whole idea of anti-anything is absurd. The body's all designed to deal with these things. So you need to support the body with these essential nutrients that can only resolve inflammation if it has the essential nutrients required for the resolving inflammation pathways. Mm -hmm. And so that's why, you know, well, I I told you I was going to do this, but I mean, that's why I created a product that has omega-3 fatty acids, uh, half cod liver oil, so it has the natural vitamin A because you need vitamin A and vitamin D together for them to work properly and vitamin D, extra vitamin D in there. So now you've got the two most important nutrients for resolving inflammation, omega-3 fatty acids and vitamin D. And you've got the sy- synergistic amount of vitamin A from the cod liver oil naturally occurring so that the, because the vitamin A and vitamin D receptors actually upregulate each other. Mm-hmm. on immune cells, on, in these, in these um, uh, inflammatory resolving pathways. So incredibly important. It's the most important thing you do. People say, oh, that's, that, that really, that stop, that's an anti-inflammatory. No, this is pro-resolving. Mm-hmm. This allows your body to resolve the inflammation. And so mm-hmm. that's why that's so incredibly important. And of co- course, we all know what they do for immunity because they're essential nutrients. So every, every cell in your body genetically requires these, including your immune cells, your T cells, especially for respiratory illnesses. But, and then you add some exercise to that. You're at the chiropractor, getting your joints moving, breaking up that scar tissue. So you can actually get the moving properly, which again, produces the neurology, which helps to be anti-inflammatory and and help you control those muscles better and have more comfort. Then you eat properly as well, and you know, proper diet. And then you deal with the emotional part because pain is an emotion. Sure. Pain is defined as an emotion. Um, it's 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 the it's the emotional response to nociceptive input that reaches your cortex. Pain is felt in your brain, not in your back. And so, um, you know, when you start dealing with 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 those stressors as well, the whole system just calms down. Yeah. People who are in chronic pain are that that's physical anxiety. Yeah. Chronic pain. Is this is exactly the same as depression, emotional that's, depression? That's There's just such chronic a, a problems. Good way of, of saying that. Can you can you repeat that, James? Because I think that, that that's going to slip by most people. You said chronic pain is physical anxiety. Correct. It's physical depression and anxiety, and and by the way, um, depression and anxiety is emotional pain. Yes. It's right. It's emotional discomfort. They're the same. They work on the same same pathways. They actually meet in the brain in the similar areas at the locus reus and the amygdala and the, and the hypothalamus. So like once you understand, and we talk about this all the time as coverage, once you understand the cause, once you understand why things are occurring, and then you would make this assumption, this is what makes us different. We make the assumption that the body has evolved through millennia, right? To, to express healthy structure and function. It's not, you know, the, our first, inclination isn't to say something's wrong with the person they're defective our thing is to say wait a minute there must be making defective choices Mm -hmm. because if you make good choices this thing's pretty bloody good that's right Right? it's it's phenomenal and so once you understand that 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 this this chronic pain is is really emotional anxiety and depression and you and you you understand what the what the cause of these things are then what we can say is, well, let's address the cause of all these things. And, ha- and when you back up for, and you go enough upstream, 
You keep going up through the physiology, through the biology, through the physiology, you end up getting leaving the body, right? Which you, which you realize is basically perfectly designed and you get up out into the habitat and choices. And you it, realize that the source of all this stuff is how they eat, move, and think. It's such a good point, though, yeah, that you make that distinction. A couple things there. First of all, you you said that we assume that the body is 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 doing what it's supposed to do, given its input, that the body is not the error, that the input is the error. So people would know this instinctually when they look at a house plant. They have a plant in their house and it starts to wilt, which is an example that you use all the time. What do you think? Oh, it's a bad plant? Or do you think, oh, I need to give it more sunlight. I need to give it more water. Maybe it needs some nutrients in the soil to, to use your, your terminology. Right. But with humans, we've been taught to make a different uh, assumption when, when we see ailing health. You also brought something up there, which I love, and I'd never heard you say before, which is chronic pain is, a, is physical anxiety. Now, the neurology of that is complicated, but it, it reminds me of that, that, that old story of the blind men who are feeling the different parts of the elephant. Well, which part is the elephant? It's all part of the same thing. Correct. Yeah. And so if you, if you address any part of that cycle, you're positively influencing the entire cycle. And you have to address all the parts at the same time for a period of time in order to turn in, in order to get sick people well. So think of the plant analogy that I use all the time. I think it's in the book Sure, it, is that, you know, you can't just give a, a wilting plant sunlight and assume it's going to get better because it might be also deficient in water and you could give it water and sunlight. And, and then, but if you don't have a healthy nutrients in the soil, the plant can't be healthy. So you have to give water, sunlight and nutrients at the same time for a long enough time for that plant to recover healthy structure and function and have a, and have, and have total plant health. But that's true of humans. That's why I always taught it, eat well, move well, think well. I try to get people to do this together so that they could understand that if you do these things together, then you'll have, you'll, 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 your, your results are exponentially better. Mm -hmm. so, so people who just come to the chiropractor and lay down and don't do anything else, they're gonna get feel better, but they're not, they're not really addressing all the, all the causes of their problem. If they go home and take the omega AD, perfect. But, but then if they're still eating a bunch of junk food, not good enough, right? If they're, if they're having emotional anxiety, which is going to end up with physical pain. I mean, depression and back pain are, are intricately related in the literature, as you know. Absolutely. And so, and, and everyone says, well, which causes which? And I always say, what a silly question. They're coming together, right? always right Two and so exactly one can cause the other and the other can cause the other i mean it's just it's it's a big it's a it's an ecosystem then you can't separate mind and body it's ridiculous and so if we can teach people to say look um here's some simple things that you can do to start out in terms of changing how you eat move and think you don't have to you don't have to give up everything that you are uh, all your bad habits right away you don't have to all of a sudden become you know one of these you know you know uh obsessive sort of you know you know weight weight trainers or marathon runner or whatever but if you just turn that ship around and you and you start giving your your body some of these nutrients that is starving you know they, 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 they deal with this with this hidden hunger of essential nutrient deficiency the nutrients of omega-3 and d the nutrients of you know uh you know healthy fats and protein the nutrients of berries and some some vegetables the nutrients of walking or exercise that's a nutrient Movement. exercise is a nutrient to your to your body and brain if you give yourself some gratitude gratitude and love are nutrients humans cannot live and thrive without these things and so when you teach people this and then you give them some strategies to do little bits at a time they see enormous changes and they become motivated and they also become convinced that their choices are making the biggest difference in their health not the pill they take not the person they go see, unless the person's telling them this, but the choices they make. That, so, that. so that's the key. That's, that's it. And, th and that was kind of the thought experiment where I wanted you to go is if, if you were called into a government meeting and they said, look, Dr. Chestnut, we're spending a fortune. We're spending $4.3 trillion and we're getting a terrible return on this investment. I can't bear to see the citizens of my country suffer like this any longer. What do I need to do to course correct and right this ship? And I think what you just said is right on the money. And that's the key, right? Was is we're so stuck debating um, who's who has to pay and how much we have to pay. We we forgot to have the real uh, most important discussion, which is what should we be paying for. Mm -hmm. And the truth is we're paying for the wrong things. We're putting all our money into the fire department. You know, the house is already on fire 
and we're spending all our money on axes and fire hoses, drugs and surgeries and fire departments, you know, medical doctors and nurses. But what we should really be doing is teaching people how to prevent fires, wellness doctors, wellness, you know, lifestyle, right? Yeah. And and so, you know, I, I always remember I was asked to give a, a, a talk at a, a huge insurance for a huge insurance company that insured all, I'm not sure if this is in the first book or the second book, but it's I think I included one of them. Here. Yeah. Oh, is it? Okay. Yeah. And I just remember being asked and I was thinking, why is an insurance company asking me? Cause I know how insurance companies are run. They're run by, they're, they're so controlled by, by the medical establishment that they, they, they really offer very little in terms of prevention or wellness or, or lifestyle, right? Because they're all taught. You have to give this drugs, 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 drugs. Everybody has a problem ends up with a drug. Let's be honest. At least let's be honest about it. Right. And so I couldn't figure out why they were asking me to come speak. You know, and and you know, my fee's not cheap, especially for insurance companies. <laughs> People have a lot of money. And I was like, why are they doing it? And then what I realized was they were in danger because they had no patient satisfaction or client satisfaction because they were having to raise their premiums every year. And it just so happened one of them had gotten a hold of my book where I talked about the fact that the re that it's impossible for insurance not to go up because so many more people are sick now and the cost of treating that sickness is so high and sick people who get diagnosed never get better. They just end up on more drugs over time and become more expensive for the insurance company. Nobody who goes to a medical doctor and gets diagnosed with, with diabetes or, or you know, high cholesterol, none of, them, none of them leave their healthy and cured. Right? They end up more expensive and sicker every year and they have more sick days. The, right? The, the average, the average uh, person, adult in the, in the United States, 55%, um, sorry, 80, 80, 80, over 80% have a chronic illness. Mm -hmm. Of all adults, over 55% have more than two. And the average person with a chronic illness misses 90 days of work productivity a year. They go to work. It's called presenteeism. They show up to work, but they're so medicated and sick that they can't produce. So they lose about 90 days a year of productivity. And who's paying for all this? And so this is all in the book. And these people now, these CEOs of these insurance companies and companies now are saying, wait a minute. We, we can't just listen to these so-called experts in medicine who just keep telling us to prescribe more pills all the time. It doesn't stop anyone from getting sick in the first place, and it doesn't cure anybody who is sick, and it never ends up costing less money. So the costs keep going up. The number of people sick keeps going up every year for 50 years. Yeah, so that, that, that's, that's kind of, that's the wild thing is at some point, somebody has to take a step back and say, hey, look, we, we can't keep going down this path. We can't keep going down it from the financial aspect of things, but the health of our, of our citizens is, is really the, the, the disaster. That's, that's horrific. And I, I think people are really waking up to this and, and, and that's why they, they need to hear your message because it, 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 we can't wait any longer. No, look at our children. We've got the sickest offspring in the history of mammals on earth. We have the sickest teenagers in the history of any species on earth. We have the sickest adults in the history of any species on earth. We have the sickest elderly in the history of any species on earth. Not just in the history of our own species, we're the sickest we've ever been. We are the sickest in terms of chronic illness and obesity and diabetes and heart disease and uh, you know emotional issues in the history of any species ever on earth. And this is what I always say to people. Look, in biology, if you have a species that's, that's getting really sick, maybe becoming endangered. There's only one way we've ever in the history of biology been able to save a species from going extinct or getting it off the endangered list. What was that? That's never been with drugs. It's never been with surgery. It's been by creating a healthy habitat for them so they can make healthy lifestyle choices. It's the only thing that's ever worked. And it's the only thing that'll work for our species. So well said. What are, you, you mentioned them again, but I hope you would reiterate the the main things that somebody who's interested in turning around and really embracing what you said that there there are no there are no uh, consequence free choices is how you framed it. What are the 
the first steps that you would recommend to somebody who wants to embrace that concept and, and turn things around for themselves and they're sick of outsourcing responsibility for their health to other people? Okay, awesome question. Now we get to talk about solutions. So I'm going to smile instead of get mad now because it's simple. The first thing I say to everybody is if it's not simple and easy, don't do it, right? Because humans are pleasure-seeking uh, missiles. We, we are literally genetically programmed to seek pleasure, not pain. And so if getting healthy represents pain to you and deprivation, you won't last. So do the easy things and tell yourself the truth, which is that the easy things are still of huge benefit. And even if you're doing some unhealthy things at the same time, the unhealthy things can't cancel the good things. So relax and don't be try, don't aim for perfection, aim for better choices and, and start with the easy ones because you'll build momentum. You'll, you'll feel better, which builds motivation. And you'll also build more self-control, which is the key to all of it. So I always say, always add positives first. Don't take away the negative choices. If you love pizza, don't start by saying no more pizza because you have pizza for a reason. It's pleasurable, whatever it is, you know, whatever your bad habits are, I can promise you, you're doing them for pleasure, either to relieve pain or to get some kind of pleasure or both. So let's not start by getting rid of the things right now that are some of the, you know, few sources of pleasure in your life. So only start by adding positives and the positives you add are, I always say, start with the easiest things. So the first thing is the essential nutrients, right? Because it takes very little effort to take these, but the benefits are overwhelming when you start addressing this hidden hunger and, and devastation of essential nutrient deficiency. And it's so easy. It takes a couple of seconds and it's not very expensive. So start because that's easy. You can start with that. So your diet's improved immensely right away when you start taking the essential nutrients. And, it, and so, so please start there. Second thing is just start having more fresh fiber first. So what, what I say is just add some kind of raw berry um, or vegetable to every meal. Could be a handful of, some people say, well, Dr. Jess, I, I only like raspberries or I only like blueberries or I, I only like carrots. Well, then that's what you have. I don't care. Just have some kind of raw fruit or vegetable, right? But, but make that, not the melons, because they are high in sugar, but like berries, blueberries, raspberries, blackberries, something like that. Um, if you can get them from a local farmer, that's better. If you can't, it is what it is. Buy frozen, they're actually better because frozen ones are the ones that are ripened on the vine and they freeze them right away so they don't rot. The ones that you get fresh are actually picked long before they're ripe. And it's at the time of ripening that all the good nutrients are put into these fruits and vegetables. So you're actually better off, believe it or not, to get frozen if you can't get local. Great tip. Okay. So you're going to eat some kind of fresh fiber first. Then you're going to find out some, you're going to, you're going to, um, Try and fill up all the time on a healthy meat, fatty meat. So chicken with lots of skin on it. Um, a, 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 if you can get grass fed and you can do it, good. Get that grass fed steak. You know, whatever you can get. Lamb is always good. Lamb and turkey are really good because they don't, they, they, they don't um, industrially raise them the same way that they do cows and chickens. So yep. turkeys all have to be free range. Birds are meant to eat grain. So when you grain feed a bird, even a chicken, it doesn't have the same devastating effect on, on the hormones of that animal and the, and the, and the type of, of meat that, you know, what's in their meat, like it does with cows. So if you can go to turkey, great chicken next, then you go lamb. Those are healthy meats for sure. Eat as many eggs as you can get in you, including the yolks, of course, that's where all the good stuff is. Um, and then go for a walk or some kind of physical exercise every day. It doesn't matter how long it is. If it's one minute, it doesn't matter, but go for a walk. And on that walk, have a gratitude um, a mantra, I call it. So, so what, what I say to people is that gratitude is free. It's objectively real. If you're alive, you have something to be grateful for. So there's always something that you don't have to make it up and fool yourself. There's something actually true, no matter where you are, that you have to be grateful for. So it's objective. It's, it's, it's like, it, it's not one of these um, things where you have to make stuff up and try and visualize something in the future. Like I, I'm saying, be grateful for something real in your life. And, and gratitude is free. It's incredibly powerful. It changes your focus from a problem. Absolutely. Because you can't be grateful and sad at the same time. It's just not possible. And it's an opiate. 
Yeah. Gratitude yeah. is an is a natural, uh, non-addictive opiate. And what it will do to your pain levels, which are very emotional, yes. what it will do to your whole life. When you wake up in the morning and you start each morning with gratitude, that changes your hormones or changes your synapses, which elicit the change in hormonal release, which changes your mood, which changes the lens through which you see the day. It's life-changing. And when you go to bed every night and you're grateful, it literally allows you to decompress. It changes your focus to gratitude instead of whatever else you're thinking about. And if that's all you did, essential nutrients, right? Fresh fiber first, try and get some fatty, healthy meat in you, right? Waters are gimme, but I'll say it. Some kind of walk or other kind of exercise, right? And gratitude. Now those things, none of those things are outrageous, right? They're not, they're, they're, they're not outside the realm of easily accomplished by 99.9% .9 of people. And if you just do that for 90 days, 90% of you will be 90% better. That's a bold claim. I love it. Try me. <laughs> so well said. Dr. James Chestnut, you have made an enormous impact on my life, on my family's life, and on hundreds and thousands of patients and members of mine. And uh, I can't thank you enough. Thank you. Isn't that neat? I get to do that with thousands of chiropractors and thousands of patients for each chiropractor, you know, and, and, and to the general public too. But I, I just think that's the thing that... Um, you know, when I'm grateful every day because I practice it, that's one of the things I'm most grateful about, which is the fact that, um, you know, I can have a life that actually um, helps people to have a better life. And I know you have the same. And isn't that the greatest? Thanks so much for watching. I really hope that you enjoyed getting just a small taste of the powerful information that Dr. Chestnut has to share. To find out more about the incredible work that he and his team are doing, you can go to eatwellmovewellthinkwell.com. I'm going to include links for that in the description down below. But before you head out of here, make sure to give the video a thumbs up and subscribe to the channel so that you're updated when the next video comes out. That's all for now. See you next time.